Hi. Um, what you see behind me here is a timeline. And uh, I generally, as a researcher, tend to find timelines, creating timelines very sort of like useful in order to locate, for example, events, activities, people uh, in time and allow uh, for the exploration of causal effects, right? And our timeline on the history of photography, as you can see here, uh, stretches all the way back to, you know, the time immemorial. And I think we intentionally try to frame you know, the history of photography in a, in a longer sort of time span because we're interested in also various ways and various attempts where uh, uh, explorations on the human optics as well as uh, different kinds of like, image making tradition who, uh, would have an effect on our understanding of photography in Malaysia today. Right. Uh, so as you can see, the timeline is interesting in the way that it's sort of like divided into two halves. On the top half, uh, we get a pretty much a standard narrative of how photography and the camera was actually in invented. And it's through a lot of like very patient process. Uh, increasingly, uh, the study of photography history are also recovering the stories of other actors. So, uh, in, you know, unlike my photography history 101 class that I took maybe 10 years ago, I've discovered through the process of putting together this exhibition, for example, the discovery of Sarah Ann Bright, uh, who's uh, recognized as one of the first female photographers, also uh, uh, was able to successfully produce a photograph in 1833. Uh, but uh, what we're interested in is not so much the, in the transfer of this photographic technology over to uh, this part of the world and how different like, movements, photography movements, was also subsequently taken up by various uh, photographers or artists uh, uh, in Malaysia. Instead, we're also trying to understand you know, what is the image uh, making tradition uh, of the past that continues to inform, I guess, photography practices in our present day. So, uh, so in some ways, what we're hinting through, you know, by look, by creating this long timeline, we're suggesting that earlier attempts think through, you know, ideas of what an image is, what representation is, are carries over into contemporary ways in which we understand photography. And this history, I think, is. Uh, quite a diverse one, it's a very playful one as well. It really shows people embracing the camera technology in uh, uh, very unexpected and surprising sort of ways. Uh, it also goes to show that while perhaps the inventor has perhaps a certain uh, very specific kind of like intention to how he envisions the camera is like being used, uh, we know that when the camera technology is released to the world, different people start to like invest different meanings and form different kinds of relationship with the camera. Uh, and that's what we hope to discover through this exhibition. I always tell my students some of the basic building blocks of uh, doing art historical research is to construct a timeline and also, if needed, create a map that enables you to locate whatever material that you're studying or looking at uh, in relation to a particular locale or a space. So for this uh, particular exhibition, uh, our curatorial team did actually employ both the mapping and the timeline uh, kind of tools in order to give ourselves a better understanding of place that we're looking at and what, is, what are the changes in terms of technology, as well as events, as well as a cultural understanding of the photograph that has taken place in Malaysia. So the process of building up a map is, of course, a very laborious one. And it is the most important ingredient uh, when you are trying to map something out is that you, you actually need to obtain certain information called data, right? And we're very lucky that Alex Mo, who was one of the principal lenders of his photographic collection to the exhibition, has also not just amassed a collection of photographs, but he also kept a lot of the photo studio sleeves and these were sleeves that was used to keep photographs and develop sort of like photographs and given to customers, right? So on the sleeves itself, what you see is that you have the address uh, written on it, but you also have, you know, very interesting typographic design. But what I'm most excited by, you know, this collection here is terminologies that was used to describe what a camera is or what a photo studio is, varies 
and changes over different periods of time and depending on who is using it, right? So you have attempts to translate this idea of the photo studio as well as the idea of photography into three other major languages in Malaysia. So you have Tamil, for example, Malay, as well as uh, 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 Mandarin, um, uh, Chinese, of course. In addition to that, uh, one of the most exciting things about these sleeves is that the dress of the photo studios are written on them. And this allowed us to actually look up these sort of photo studios using contemporary mapping software, freely available online, such as like Google Maps, Google My Maps, where we are able to then pinpoint where the photo studios are located. Now, it might seem like a smooth and easy sort of process, but of course, road names have changed over time in Malaysia, especially since independence, all the roads and the names of the roads have been changed. So it also requires us to consult older directories, get older maps, understand how different numbering systems work, so how they have like changed over time. But more importantly, to get a sense of the photo studio within a small town, very often we're required to actually use Google Street View in order to place ourselves within the small town. Thankfully, yeah, during the MCO period, most of us was effectively under house quarantine. There was a lot of time to explore uh, small towns at our own leisure pace online. By building up this database of up to currently 420 entries, we're able to then start identifying interesting patterns and make some generalizations and assumptions about how photo studios mean in a Malaysian context. Of course, this research isn't exhaustive, it's not complete yet. And one of the nicest things about putting together an exhibition is that we're also creating a platform that invites people to participate in this ongoing conversation, in our ongoing interest, create a much more extensive database and cultural map of photo studios in Malaysia. So if you're interested to participate, don't forget to check out uh, the database itself. You're able to do so by scanning this QR code uh, over here at the exhibition or visit our website. This is quite an interesting and so special wall for us. It primarily show reproduction photographs that are found in a two-volume publication uh, published in 1906 uh, called Pagan Races of Malaya. And in this particular book, Blackden and Skate, uh, two authors, uh, were principally interested in creating an exhaustive compendium on Orang Asli life and culture in Malaya. Of course, when we look back at this enterprise in what their initiative, we begin to notice in the text themselves that there are a lot of very difficult passages, passages that tend to exhibit various kinds of racial prejudices, as well as various colonial frameworks that tend to cast the Orang Asli as backward and primitive. However, what we also discovered is that the photographs do tend to show a much more sort of complex reality. It reflects an ongoing negotiation of a particular community in Malaya that was trying to find their place and find their sense of self within the modern world, right? So in trying to look through these photographs, we can sort of think of these photographs as violent colonial enterprise in order to subject the Orang Asli as this cultural other. But the nice thing about looking at photographs is that they tell um, of a much more slippery reality and the meanings that they contain is it's much more fluid. It allows us to imagine different ways in which we can understand uh, this particular community in Malaysia. So for example, what we discovered in many of those photographs, moments and activities that we do not normally associate with Orang Asli culture. So for example, up here you can see uh, uh, Orang Asli violinist. The violin is a very central instrument that's being used by a particular culture or groups amongst the Orang Asli. There are also different group portraits, for example here, where you see the Orang Asli playing an active role within the civil service of a Malay's like government. So when we like, imagine the Orang Asli as this isolated group that's principally domiciled in the forest without means of contacting the outside world, that's not entirely an accurate picture. And by arranging the photographs this way on the wall, we were hoping to play with the idea that maybe the photographs can be displayed as photographic portraits that you see in a normal middle-class home.
of any normal Malaysian, right? Uh, in that way, uh, what we're also suggesting is that perhaps the Oranasi's participation in modernity is not one of exclusion only. I think there's a much more complex series of negotiations that's going on that the photograph manages to capture and that we can actually learn about this through closely looking at those photographs.